Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about rhombi, rectangles, and squares. Up on the screen, you'll see your exit question. We're going to start off with the second day of 8.4, talking about the official definitions for rhombus, rectangle, and square, three of the quadrilaterals that we've been dealing with in class. Now, each of these definitions uh, are a little clunky for reasons that I'll explain in just a moment. And there's a very small side note saying that the plural of rhombus is rhombi. So little trivia for you. Um, first off, let's just run through the definitions. Rhombus, a parallelogram with four congruent sides. So all four sides are equal in length. A rectangle is a parallelogram with four right angles. And then a square is a parallelogram with both those conditions, having four right angles and four congruent sides. Now I said that these definitions are a little bit clunky because you look at the definitions and they reference a parallelogram, which is a specific type of quadrilateral. And I might have expected that just to be a generic umbrella term like a quadrilateral with four congruent sides. You might ask yourself, why did they reference a special type of quadrilateral when they could have just done, it seems like you could show the same thing with a rhombus using just the generic term quadrilateral. And I think the reason that they use parallelogram rather than quadrilateral is going way back to the very beginning of the year when we talked about the very basic axioms of geometry itself. And one of those axioms was that if you have a line and a point, that you can draw a line through that point that is parallel to the original line. And I think through that definition, you can very quickly construct a parallelogram based on those very basic axioms. So rather than dealing with the definition of a polygon and whatnot, you can create a parallelogram very quickly and apply these conditions to it. And then you have a rhombus. But like I said, it's a little clunky, so we can do a little bit better than that. And that's why we have these corollaries. So the first corollary we have is the rhombus corollary, which states exactly what I thought a rhombus was, uh, which was a quadrilateral uh, is a rhombus if and only if it has four congruent sides. Notice that this is a biconditional statement. We're going to reintroduce you to the biconditional statement, the if and only if phrase or abbreviated IFF. And of course, remember, it means that symbol right there. But I digress. The meat here is that if you have a quadrilateral with four congruent sides, it is a rhombus. And if you have a quadrilateral that is a rhombus, then it must have four congruent sides. So remember that biconditional statements work in both directions. So if you need to prove that something is a rhombus, you can do it using this corollary. Or if you know that something is a rhombus and you need to prove that it has four congruent sides, you can also use this corollary. It works both directions. Likewise, we have a rectangle corollary, which basically says if you have a quadrilateral that has four right angles, it is a rectangle. And if you have a quadrilateral that is a rectangle, then it must have four right angles. And finally, the square corollary, which says exactly what you might think it is, that if you have a quadrilateral that is a square, then it must have four right angles and four congruent sides. And conversely, if you have a quadrilateral that has four right angles and four equal sides, it better be a square. And the only thing that's tricky about this corollary and using it to prove stuff is that it has an and statement. So if you were to use it in the reverse, you have to show that it's a rhombus and a rectangle before you can show that it's a square. So there's an and statement wrapped up in an if and only if statement. Here's a cool Venn diagram of how a whole bunch of quadrilaterals fit together. Notice that squares are in the sweet spot right in the middle. They are all types of those types of quadrilaterals that we've talked about so far. Next up, we have yet more theorems. We're going to have three more theorems, and they're all going to be if and only if theorems. Uh, so you can use them both in the forward conditional manner and the reverse converse manner. First one is, if you have a parallelogram that is a rhombus, then its diagonals are perpendicular. So a rhombus has perpendicular diagonals both ways. Second one, a rhombus 
diagonals bisect pairs of opposing angles or the diagonals bisect each each interior angle of a rhombus and that again goes both ways if you have a rhombus then the diagonals bisect each interior angle if you have diagonals bisecting interior angles then it must be a rhombus and the third and final theorem theorem 8.13 is about rectangles and it simply states that and I don't like the labelings on this drawing uh, it states that if you have a rectangle then its diagonals are congruent or if you have a quadrilateral with congruent diagonals then it must be a rectangle okay so this is a way that you can prove that thing the diagonals are congruent or that you have a rectangle okay real world situation carpentry suppose you're tasked with digging a hole in which a house will be built the house has a rectangular footprint of 40 feet by 30 feet and the only tools you have available are a 150 foot tape measure, some stakes to drive into the ground to mark locations, and a helper. I want you to pause the video and describe how you could mark the ground to tell the excavator where to dig. It is crucial that the hole is a rectangle, so perfectly rectangular, right angles, and you don't want to dig more dirt than is necessary. So use the stakes to mark out remember this is just like we're just starting to build a house so all you have is this giant field in front of you you have no aerial view and your job is to mark out a perfect rectangle of those dimensions pause the video and see if you can figure out a solution okay one solution uh, is to think about the diagonals if we want a rectangle then we know that the diagonals have to be of equal length and you might have noticed that I chose these distances quite conveniently. This is a version of a 3, 4, 5 triangle, so it would be 30, 40, and 50. So we'd want the diagonals to be 50 feet. So one way that you could do this is mark a corner. Put a stake right there on that corner, and then measure 30 feet from it, and then 40 feet from that in what you think is a right angle. So from your first stake, mark out 30 feet throw your second stake down. It's very easy to make a straight line. That's no problem. Now here's where you start to guess is you start to head off in this direction, which is what you think is a 90 degree angle. You're not sure about it, but you're going to throw down a stake in 40 feet at a straight line. And then you're going to go this way for 30 feet. Again, you're guessing, is this a right angle? I don't know, but I'm going to throw down a stake right here. And once you do that, then you're going to measure the diagonals. Okay. And you're hoping that they are perfectly 50 feet and if they are awesome you've got a rectangle and you can be done but let's say they weren't let's say you did all that work and you measured the diagonals between your stakes and you got that this diagonal was 50 and a half feet and this diagonal was 49 and a half feet pause the video and think about how you would fix that okay in order to fix that you know that this diagonal has to be shorter so you'd pick up this stake and move it probably a little bit this way or a little bit this way just to shorten the diagonal a little bit or you might do take this stake right here and just lengthen it a little bit over this way or that way or any combination of the two but either way after you'd move the stakes you'd have to check it again and you might have to do this three or four or five or six times until you got it absolutely perfect or there's a second way to do it, which actually goes back to other things that we've done before. And it talks about a Pythagorean triple, and this is the way it's usually done. So using two people, three people is better, but throw down a stake in this corner. And you're going to put the stake through the little loop at the end of the tape measure that marks the zero point. And then you're also going to tie the tape measure around the stake at the 120 foot mark. Okay, now why is that? Why is 120 feet? Why 120 feet, you ask? Well, we'll get to that. So then you're going to unravel the tape, like completely unspool 120 feet of it. And your friend is going to hold on to the 30 foot mark, and you're going to hold on to the 70 foot mark. And all you're going to do is walk away from each other until the tape measure is taut, tight between the two of you and the stake. And that will ensure that your friend is 30 feet away from the stake and you are 50 feet away from the stake. And not only that, but you are exactly 40 feet away from your friend. 
So immediately that gives you a 3, 4, 5 right triangle just scaled up times 10. And that will give you, if you each drop a stake right at your feet, that'll give you the corners. Uh, you could just repeat that again over on this side or just repeat it from where you threw down your stake uh, to find this corner. And that's generally the way it's done. And this is a highly accurate way to do it. Uh, it's almost impossible to screw up. So there's a real world application of what we're learning. Here's your assignment. I'll see you next time.